Uh, well, um, hello everybody. It's, it's just gone afternoon, uh, but it's fantastic uh, to have you with us for this event hosted by the UK government and the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. Uh, the UK government commissioned the report we're going to talk about, Closing the STEM Gender Gap, a study of gender and STEM representations in UK family television from the renowned Gina Davis Institute. And it's fantastic to be able to have Gina Davis with us, an Academy Award winner, a fantastically accomplished and well-known actor, and founder and chair of the Gina Davis Institute. Uh, she has been recognized not only for her superb acting in so many movies, but also for her advocacy of gender equality in the media. And I think she may have been one of the first people uh, really to highlight how important it is that young girls, as they're growing up, uh, have all the positive uh, reinforcement and the role models uh, to help them really uh, realize their potential. I think too late, uh, we come to this only when uh, girls are more grown up, when they're leaving school, when they're going to college and university. Uh, and Gina has shown that you really need to start uh, much earlier with this. Um, we're very grateful for what her institute has done. We're very grateful for the research uh, insights. And we want to work with the institute to create gender balance and foster inclusion and reduce negative stereotyping in, in family media as well. Um, it's also my pleasure to give a very warm welcome to Millie Davis, the highly talented actor from Odd Squad, and to Billy McQueen, who's the co-founder of Daryl McQueen. They're also going to speak to us today about the importance of increasing on-screen diversity in both the US and the UK. And I, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Healy. Uh, Sarah is the permanent secretary in the UK's Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, she's a very good friend of mine. We work very closely together, uh, but she's joining the panel as a particular expression of the UK government's commitment to advancing the diversity and inclusion agenda. Uh, for the UK, our creative industries are absolutely vital uh, to our economy. Uh, they're dynamic uh, and they're global. For Hollywood, uh, we export more UK villains to Hollywood than possibly many other UK exports. Uh, one in eight businesses uh, in the UK is in creative industries. And as a sector, it generates more than $139 billion a year towards the economy, our economy, and it employs uh, 2 million people. Uh, so I hope those figures uh, give you a sense of why it is so important that we use this sector uh, to start helping young people, young girls in particular, realize their potential. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of power that we can harness there in support of diversity and inclusion, and specifically in support of two of our uh, key goals, closing the gender gap and increasing the number of women and girls in STEM. Uh, and we really want to continue to work uh, with the creative industries to promote on-screen diversity. Uh, and just as we were chatting before this session started, um, Gina and I were chatting about Jurassic Park, how they, um, when they made the movie, they flipped uh, one of the characters uh, in the book uh, to making the girl uh, be the character on screen uh, who was pushing the computer programming and who was a computer whiz kid. And that's exactly the sort of thing we need to do more of. In a few minutes, we're going to hear from Dr. Caroline Heldman. Caroline is Vice President of Research and Insights at the Gina Davis Institute, and she's going to give us an overview of the report and its findings. Uh, a couple of things, though, that, that struck me before I hand over. Uh, it's clear, I think, UK has work to do in this field. Uh, male STEM characters outnumber female ones two to one in children's programming. I think secondly, though, we should take heart. There are signs of progress in UK children's programming and STEM characters of color are well represented relative to the UK population. And moreover, women are not shown as needing to sacrifice their personal lives. Female STEM characters are shown working collaboratively and using STEM to help others, which research shows has a very positive effect on young girls. 
And then finally, the report shows how much UK and US can learn from each other. The US reached economic, reached gender parity uh, in 2019 in its children's television programming, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, but the gender and STEM gap, uh, the STEM gap in particular, still persists. And that's what we want to use today's session uh, to resolve. Uh, so we want to work together. We want to take this forward. I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic uh, session today. Thanks to Stephanie and to Gina and everyone who's made it possible. And I'm now going to hand over to Gina with many thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Pierce and the British Consulate in New York for funding the first ever global STEM in media study and for hosting this event. As many of you know, engaging girls to pursue careers in STEM has been an important pillar of our research. And as we know, what we see on screen influences what happens in the real world. Our previous research has demonstrated that when girls see female characters in STEM careers, it opens up their views on what they can aspire to be. As our tagline goes, if she can see it, she can be it. It was fascinating to see how the UK and the US compare when it comes to diversity in STEM. As Ambassador Pierce mentioned, there's a lot that the US and the UK can learn from each other. While there's about the same number of female STEM characters in the UK and the US, there are far more female STEM leads in the UK than in the US. Both of our countries have significant progress to make, of course, when it comes to other areas of diversity, particularly LGBTQ characters, people with disabilities, people aged 50 and over, and people with large body types. We know that increasing on-screen portrayals of women and girls in STEM is easy to do and can produce great influence and impact. I hope everyone will take the time to read through our recommendations at the end of the report. I'm heartened to see the content creators in the UK have done a great job at avoiding stereotypes. We encourage all of the content creators who are watching today to keep pushing for more diverse female STEM characters in their projects. STEM characters can appear anywhere, not just in a laboratory or in front of a computer. And just as importantly, there's a big role for parents to play as well. Let's encourage our girls to pursue STEM activities and studies. <clears throat> Consider watching content that features girls and women in STEM with them. We're very excited to present these findings to you, along with our panel of esteemed con content creators and artists. So now over to you, Caroline, to present the research. Thank you, Gina, and it is an honor to present this research uh, and to work for the Institute as a woman in STEM, as a data scientist. Um, we come in all different ages, shapes, sizes, races, um, and so we want to focus in on what the worlds uh, around girls and women in STEM look like in UK family television. Um, in case you don't know uh, about the Institute, um, as my esteemed boss, Gina Davis, uh, noted, we look at lots of different representations. We focus on gender, race, LGBTQ+, ability, age, and body size representations. And in this particular report, we want to narrow in on girls and women in STEM. So what is the problem we're addressing? The problem is in the UK, men outnumber one, uh, sorry, men outnumber women three to one in STEM professions. That is a rather large gap. It is persisted and there are many reasons why this gap exists. Existing research tells us that it starts in childhood uh, when boys and girls uh, and gender non-conforming children are getting different signals from their parents about going into STEM. And this continues on in educational experiences where they get different levels of encouragement and types of encouragement from their peers and from teachers. And we know that once uh, they get into higher ed, that there are differences in terms of grants and support and leadership. And indeed in the STEM professions, very few women end up rising to the ranks of leadership. So you can really think about this as a lifelong um, kind of uh, pipeline where you lose girls and women at every point. So we want to look at, and for this particular study, the role that media plays in girls and women leaving the STEM pipeline at every leaky joint. 
We partnered with the British Consulate General in New York, and this is the very first systematic assessment of the role that media plays in the persistent STEM gender gap in the UK. So just quickly, our methodology, we generated a sample of 996 STEM characters from the top 100 children's shows in the UK. Um, these shows are from the year 2020, and you'll notice we focused on streaming because that's where folks are seeing this content during the global pandemic. Um, we use two primary approaches to this research. The first, uh, expert human coders, 11 trained researchers evaluated how various characters are portrayed. And we also looked uh, using automated coding, we looked at screen time and speaking time for girls and women in STEM um, using our patented uh, Gina Davis inclusion quotient technology. Um, so machine learning combined with expert human coding. And this is what we found. First, um, we find that STEM characters, male STEM characters outnumber female STEM characters two to one. And we're using the terms male and female uh, to capture both boys and men and girls and women, if you're wondering why we're using those labels. So uh, male characters outnumber uh, female STEM characters two to one. So the gap is massive. You'll notice it's not as massive as the real world. So media representations are doing a bit better than the real world, but if we want to reach gender parity, content creators could actually create a gender balanced world in STEM tomorrow, as, as Gina likes to say. Um, it is a medium where you could immediately represent the worlds that you want to see. So if women are 51% of the population, they can be half of STEM characters tomorrow. Um, when it comes to leading characters, we actually find that the gap is even larger. So leading STEM characters, boys and men are more likely to be represented in children's content and TV content in the UK than girls. Um, screen time and speaking time, we actually find some more positive findings. Uh, you'll notice 43.8% of screen time, so female characters are not getting the same amount of screen time. But if you compare that, remember the gap that it's uh, male characters uh, outnumber female characters two to one, uh, the amount of screen time they get, girls and women, when they show up, is actually higher than their, their overall numbers. Um, so it's not a parody, but it there when uh, female STEM characters show up, uh, they are getting a lot of screen time, uh, more than, than the same characters for boys and men. Um, we're also finding that it's much more amplified and positive uh, with female characters accounting for almost two thirds of speaking time. So again, even though the number of girls and women in STEM in children's uh, content in the UK is low, um, their screen time and their speaking time um, speak volumes. In terms of looking now at whether or not girls um, and boys are encouraged to pursue STEM, remember in the real world, this matters an awful lot. So taking that logic of um, the idea that kids seeing a uh, girl versus boy characters on the screen being encouraged to engage in STEM will have a similar effect. We find you know, a troubling gap that male characters or boy characters are far more likely, significantly more likely than girls to be encouraged uh, to pursue STEM. We also find um, that male STEM characters are more likely to be shown as leaders in a STEM profession uh, than female characters. So one in three male characters is shown as a STEM leader compared to only one in four female characters. A positive finding, or many positive findings, um, we didn't find any gender gaps in terms of STEM characters uh, who are competent, um, experts, empowered, and highly intelligent. This means uh, that once uh, girls and women are actually showing up as STEM characters, they are being portrayed as being just as competent, um, having the same levels of expertise, being just as empowered, and being highly intelligent at the same rates as uh, male characters. We also find um, and that an overwhelming number of STEM characters are shown working in collaboration with others. This is highly positive because we know that, first off, this is actually how STEM works in the real world. But secondly, um, that girls and women are more likely to be attracted to STEM if it is shown as a collaborative experience. Um, we also find something similar with portrayals of using STEM to help others. An overwhelming number of uh, characters are shown using STEM 
in the service of others, which is particularly attractive to girls and women and increases the likelihood that they will go into STEM if they believe that they will use STEM to help others. Um, we find some kind of tired stereotypes that are common in media are showing up with female STEM characters as well. Uh, about 2% are shown in revealing clothing, so sexually objectified at a significantly higher rate than male characters. Um, we didn't find many tropes or stereotypes, and we're working with, you know, long lists of tropes and stereotypes for girls and women in STEM. Um, what we did find, the most common tropes and stereotypes were the Smurfette, a uh, stereotype where you have one woman in STEM surrounded by a group of men in STEM. Um, and we also found uh, a, an occasional nod to the overly confident male in STEM who kind of crowds out women um, in scenes. In terms of representations of characters of color, also another very important element in terms of seeing role models in STEM, we find um, that 28.6% of STEM characters in kids' content um, are characters of color compared to 13% of the UK population. So uh, incredible representations of diversity there. We also find that one in three female STEM characters are women of color. Um, in terms of underrepresentations, um, the, this is our intersectional approach to our work. We find that STEM characters are underrepresented uh, when it comes to LGBTQ plus characters, characters who are ages 50 plus, characters with disabilities and characters with large body types. And I wanna make the pitch that uh, just like role models for girls in STEM, the more people can see diversity on the screen in terms of STEM, the more likely they will be to pursue these occupations. So if they see themselves um, in a diverse uh, set of identities, then they can imagine themselves being that in the real world. We also did a comparison of the UK versus the US and by and large the UK um, outdoes the US on most of our measures. Um, we find that the number of characters are roughly equal uh, US to UK uh, kids content, but we find that there are when it comes to leading STEM characters. Um, there are far more in the UK than in the US, a very positive sign for the UK. We also find that this barrier that we discovered in, in US representation, um, that female characters, STEM characters are often shown as sacrificing their personal life. It's just, it rarely shows up in UK content, which is a very positive finding for the UK. Um, we also find that female STEM characters uh, in the US are twice as likely to be shown as leaders. Um, and so uh, this bodes well for the US. Um, it's shown in working collaboratively with STEM, the UK comes out on top in terms of that, which is really positive. And I should note that while girls and women are drawn to STEM when it is shown as being more collaborative or they view it as being more collaborative, boys and men are also more likely to wanna to go into STEM if they think it's collaborative and also if they think that it is helping others. And again, we find that, that the UK comes out on top when it comes to representations that the percentage of characters who are shown using STEM to help others. So we put together uh, a number of action steps for parents and then action steps for content creators. Um, I will run through these quickly and not read off my screen, um, but definitely for parents, encourage girls to pursue STEM activities uh, and studies, whether they have an interest in it or not, because we know there's a gap where boys get encouraged regardless of their interest, but girls do not. So bridge that gap, encourage girls to go into STEM regardless of whether they are showing um, an, an affinity for it, develop that. Um, obviously engage in STEM activities. We highly recommend Legos and other creative building sets. Um, make a point to watch content that features girls and women in STEM so they see these role models and also provide real world role models um, beyond film and television and also uh, openly challenging stereotypes. And it's something that we're asking content creators to do as well, although many are already doing that. Um, first, cast and write more women in STEM professions and more girls who are engaged in STEM activities, especially in kids' content, and write more as leaders. Um, also write more adults encouraging girls to go into STEM so that girls who are watching that and boys who are watching that see that, that it is a domain that is for boys, girls, and gender nonconforming children and make a point to cast across uh, STEM occupations. We have this idea that you know, scientists 
are uh, white men in white uh, lab coats. I think that's the most prominent stereotype when you ask kids to draw a scientist still today. Um, although it's gotten better over time, we know that that stereotype is very prevalent. So show uh, folks who look like a lot of different things engaged in a lot of different STEM activities outside of the lab, you know, ocean oceanographers, um, folks who are, you know, studying the migration patterns of elephants. Um, define STEM in, a, in ways that go beyond labs. Also, um, you know, let, let characters look like a lot of different things. Don't sexualize girls uh, or women who are uh, engaging in STEM because we know that sexual objectification ends up dehumanizing characters. Um, and then actively write and cast uh, STEM characters that bust stereotypes. Um, again, with this intersectional approach, we know that if you can see it, you can be it, and this extends well beyond gender, that if people see themselves um, in all of the richness of the identities that humans have, they are more likely to pursue a career and a life in STEM. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hannah Young, and I'm the Deputy Consul General here in New York. And it's fitting that we're having this event today because it's International Day of Women and Girls in STEM. Uh, I'd like to thank with an I'd like to start with an enormous uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Caroline Heldman for taking us through the Gina Davis Institute's uh, research into STEM and diversity in children's TV in the UK. As Caroline outlined, and as others have said, there are positive findings here, uh, but still much more to do. Uh, so I'm delighted to be moderating today's panel session with an excellent uh, panel uh, to talk about some of these solutions and issues further. Uh, please do, put your questions through the Zoom Q&A. Uh, we will leave plenty of time at the end to uh, pick up on uh, audience questions. Uh, but, th but without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Sarah Healy, uh, Permanent Secretary for the UK's Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Billy McQueen, co-founder and of the multi-BAFTA award-winning UK indie production house, Daryl McQueen, and Millie Davis, who plays the brilliant Mrs. O on the TVO Kids PBS Kids series, Odd Squad. So welcome to all three of you today. Sarah, I want to start with you. Um, you run uh, DCMS. Uh, which is a department with an ever expanding remit, uh, which now covers everything from cybersecurity and 5G through to uh, the creative industries and I think also tackling loneliness. Um, I'm interested in the wider perspective that that must give you. What do you see as the key uh, diversity and inclusion issues facing the media and the creative industries and why are they important? Thank you so much, Hannah, and absolutely lovely to be here. Uh, thank you for asking me to join. Uh, terrific to meet my fellow panellists, and I really enjoyed hearing about that uh, research. And also special thanks to you, Hannah, for all of your work in, in making all of this happen. Um, I am uh, so impressed by the work of the Institute, and uh, I don't think we really have something similar in the UK. So uh, that's got me thinking as well. Uh, you're right that DCMS has this incredibly broad portfolio and um, issues like diversity and representation really run across almost all of the sectors that we represent. So as you say, they're very, very broad. But in fact, if I think about each of them, they all have challenges of their own when it comes to diversity, both in those who work in them and in how people are represented. So uh, I think one of the things I've always reflected on is that many of the sectors we work with would think of themselves as very progressive, but actually have quite a lot of issues with uh, keeping women in particular in those careers, attracting them to them in the first place and keeping them in them. I mean, the, the issues for the digital sector, I think are sort of very well documented and, and understood and more feel sort of more traditional. But I mean, the same is true in culture, the same is true in, in creative industries. And our ministers have done uh, quite a lot of work with 
particularly the media sector, to try and encourage both better representation, but also uh, better um, openness to women to join those careers and to make progress in them. And um, I mean, one of the things I'm really interested in there and, and sort of took a little bit from some of the research is this concept of uh, a sort of leaky pipeline. So people sort of join these careers. And I think it's incredibly important that people work in the media in order to improve representation, actually. I'm sure that the two to some degree must be related. Um, so they join and then they, they uh, and then and then they leave. But we actually in the UK have a problem with joining. And part of that is to do with the fact that um, the creative industries tend to be quite concentrated in the London and the South East. It makes it difficult for people to start those careers. Unpaid internships are a huge problem, uh, which mean that uh, people from underrepresented backgrounds can often find it really difficult, including uh, including women. and. Um, but then we also uh, have challenges that are to do with the barriers to progression. So in advertising, for instance, only 17% of creative directors are women. Um, in t TV, disabled people make up fewer than 5% of key con contributions, despite being 17% of the general population. And I think that that is a whole range of issues to do with kind of working culture and the sense of priority that's given to this and also the fragmented nature of the industry uh, as well where a lot of small production houses don't necessarily see the totality of what's happening in individual careers um for example i was recently uh on a um recruitment panel uh we recruited a job share and one of the people on the recruitment panel was a was a former TV producer and he said he'd never come across a job share, whereas for many of us, this is quite a kind of normal way of ensuring that women with caring responsibilities can stay in their in their roles and, and keep progressing. So, um, so, I mean, I think it's incredibly important that we both ensure that those representational issues are dealt with, but also that I think part of that has to be about ensuring that women can enter and pursue and progress in careers in media and the creative industries. I'd also, if it's not too cheeky, I'd be really interested in Billy's view uh, when he speaks about the role of public service broadcasting in ensuring a diverse representation. So I think that's a bit of a contrast between the UK and the US. And I'd be really, really, really interested to hear what he thinks about what impact that has as we start our our view of public service broadcasting and thinking about what that might look like for the future. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I was really interested in your comments around the lack of diversity in the workforce itself, because I guess if, if you're a content creator, but you're ultimately not representing the society that you're creating for, then presumably that reinforces the, 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 the stereotypes that, that find their way into um, TV. I was also interested in your comments about um, uh, creating a more diverse workforce in itself. And, and I wonder if you could give us um, your thoughts on how we can get better at that. In particular, I wonder whether COVID in a way might have helped with that in terms of the flexibility that it might have brought people uh, in the way that they do their jobs now and the way that they communicate effectively with, with other people. Sure. I mean, it's definitely shown that, uh, you know, jobs in, in these kinds of industries can be done from home, they can be done flexibly, they can be done taking account of caring responsibilities rather than uh, it being expected that you're focused on them all the time. As ever, with everything to do with has the world changed because of COVID, I think we have to be really careful in saying how easily could we move back to just working in the way that we did before and having the same expectations. And indeed, might we revert to it very, very quickly because we're so relieved to be sort of uh, to be released but um, so I think it's something we need to keep a really close eye on. How do we do it? Well I mean some of it is about um, organizations that have huge amount of influence in this uh, taking responsibility and large organizations so do you think the BBC is really relevant here because they are able to sort of recruit and train in a different way over the long term? Um, I think uh, apprenticeships are actually really important here and one of the things that we've been thinking about is uh, how you ensure that apprenticeships work in the creative industries where people are moving between organizations and between roles quite quickly because you're working on different kinds of projects just to enable entry into, into careers. Um, 
And also just a better awareness of what's available in terms of careers in the creative industries. I think, you know, I observe with my own children, because I come across these, these careers, I can talk about them. But actually, a lot of kids leaving school or going into university or, or going to college, they're not, they're not aware of what an extraordinary range of jobs and careers there are in the creative industries uh, or how to get into them. And so I think we need to raise awareness as well. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and you make an important point, which is that ultimately this isn't just um, something that government uh, should take responsibility for. It's um, an industry challenge as well. Uh, and I'd like to bring in Billy now to um, the discussion. Billy, we're delighted to have you um, virtually as part of the delegation to Kids Screen uh, as well this week. Uh, so a warm welcome to you. Uh, as well as to others from the Kids Screen delegation who I know are on the line and of course the Children's Media Conference. Um, Billy, you have great diversity in the shows that you produce uh, from Chip and Potato on Netflix to my children's personal favourite, Waffle the Wonder Dog. Um, in your experience, uh, how is the UK industry doing on diversity and inclusion? and STEM, and, and were there any particular headlines in the research that surprised you? And Billy, you'll have to take yourself off mute, I'm afraid. Yeah, Millie Perfect. wouldn't have made that mistake because she's a lot younger than I am. <laughs> um, now I'm unmuted. Uh, that was That's a couple of questions to unpack. Um, I think the first one, um, is to answer Sarah's question. Um, it's quite a relief because I jotted down a few programmes that I thought reflect the UK industry's uh, kind of good output on diversity and the fact that we're striving to do better. Um, I do think that we do need this kind of systemic systematic analysis that that's that's been delivered um by dr caroline hellman it is absolutely fantastic and it really punctures the hot air um that you hear about in various meetings and i'm sure i've been guilty of it myself about saying things are all fine on diversity and inclusion once you get you know analysis of this quality it's it's much easier to then benchmark and go forward but as, as a quick, um, I noted down a couple of programmes before we started, which I think are interesting within the UK. I think in terms of STEM, I think a big change up came from the BBC when they they cast Doctor Who, which is a sci fi family series, which was prime time on Saturday early evening. They cast Doctor Who had been a male character since 1963. Mm -hmm and they cast Jodie Whittaker as the new Doctor. Um, she's been that character for four years. And the significance, the only way I could think of it is, it's a bit like Captain Kirk uh, on Star Trek, um, suddenly becomes Captain Carla. And it, it was only really the BBC that could do something as major as that, because I think the commercial channels would have been worried about advertising revenues. So it's, it's more difficult for the commercial channels to make those kind of big decisions. Then when you're look, looking at the, 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 um, the kids programming, um, there's two shows that CBeebies do, which I find a huge relief. Uh, there's, there's Maddie's, um, do you know, which is the most brilliant engineering and science, a really simple preschool show. It's factual entertainment. Um, it's it's just excellent, along with Grace's amazing machines. And Grace is in leather and on this massive motorbike. And she goes and looks at all these incredible machines from diggers through to sand shifters on beaches through to machines that move houses. Um, and that's fantastic from my point of view because my nearly three-year-old grandson and his best friend Coral were always watching diggers and, and various bits on YouTube which were randomly put together JCBs and stuff like that so to have something crafted and have some, something fronted by great female science leads is, and at four three and four-year-olds is absolutely great 
and, and my biggest concern is some of the material that you can randomly select on YouTube. I think another thing that we've done, the UK has done really well, is kind of the family shows. There's a show called Winter Watch in the UK, and that has all has been brilliant for seven or eight years. But actually, COVID has allowed it to bring in some new young female presenters. And there's a brilliant 24, 25 year old zoologist who's come on, uh, Megan McCubbin. And, and ironically, um, COVID has actually helped free up space to get some of this talent through. Um, and, I, and then again, you know, there's, there's other great children's stuff, Junior Master Chef, which helps kind of burst the bubble of chefs being shouty Gordon Ramsay types. Um, and then we can also bring in stuff into the UK. You know, there's great shows, uh, Doc McStuffins, of course, um, Odd Squad, which Millie stars in. Um, and there's other shows, you know, that don't come, you know, from from the BBC, which I think is the key place. But you've got things like An Androids, which also Millie was in, which is made in Canada by Sinking Ship. That was great. That's on Amazon. Um, you've got some other great other great shows coming in from netflix and on apple plus but the the bbc has got to be the starting place both in in children's where it's pretty pretty tight and ahead of the game but now coming into prime time on on family and into drama it's really good and and changing doctor who from a male of the last 30 years into a a really sassy female sci-fi uh, lead was really great so I think that's a kind of snapshot of the UK, given 15 minutes to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Um, and thank you for all of those tips. Um, and I now have the Do You Know soundtrack ringing in my head. So um, thank you in particular for that. Um, but I agree with you, that is an excellent show. Um, I'm really interested in um, your personal experience of integrating STEM diversity in, into your shows. Uh, and it would be really interesting to just understand a little bit more when you're producing a show, what do you think about in terms of the characters that you're producing and the work that they do and the activities that they carry out? Um, it, it's got to, it's always about creating the time and space. I mean, I think the problem for producers is pressure, pressure, pressure. Um, so you have to, you have to really early on what, you know the creators and the showrunners and your head writer so on waffle that was Catherine williams you've got to sit down and you've got to be quite clear but it changes so much from genre to genre so waffle is a was a serialized drama comedy and we pushed to get 30 episodes in the first series and now for, for a serialized comedy and drama, you're absolutely hoovering up story. So you've got to sit there, you've got to get your team of writers and you've got to go through the main characters that you've put in the initial pitch and, and work out how they're going to fulfill both STEM requirements, but also story. So, so the good news for us, you know, in, in Waffle, we wanted the mum, Jess, not to just be a good mum, but to have a career. And Vet was a really good one, especially as we needed someone to contain this little puppy who turned out to talk. So great to have a vet. And it was really interesting from the research that in, instinctively we wanted her to have a great family life and to be running the family, as most females do in the UK, and holding down a full time job. Um, and we, yeah, vet was great because it was the same thing. You see too many white middle-aged middle-class men in white coats taking those roles. Um, and, but you, you, we, when you're talking through the characters, you're also looking for story. So, um, it's a blended family. So Doug's mum, um, bizarrely, we turned her into a marine biologist and she was working away in Alaska. Um, but that also feeds into story. The fact that you've got grandparents there who are over 60, 70 also helps for storylines because dramas, well, as Millie will know, they hoover up story. Um, it's slightly different in some of the other genres, uh, which is why I'm so pleased that the factual ent uh, and, and some of the animations are pulling into that area as well. But 
it's all about taking that time at the beginning because if you don't get it in the script if you're not thinking about it you're you're really in trouble um, one thing we've done which is after the fir- after the bible and the first draft scripts what episode one two or three um before we we knew about dr caroline hellman's advice the, there's a german um system called uh, i've got to look it up naropa uh, naropa.steve.com n-e-r-o-p-a dot s-t-i-e-v-e dot com and it was um created by a german actress who found that a she wasn't getting any parts after the age of 40 and b that females were really not there it's a really simple way of grading to male characters female characters or non-assigned characters and then just looking at the balance in your script um, and it's really quick um the information that, that's in the report there's there's four or five of those types of analysis grids but this one we found really easy and it's a great way of getting um writers and head writers to have a quick test to see how the balance is Thank you for that. Um, it sounds like Gina Davis, the Gina Davis Institute's um, solutions for content creators resonated with you then. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's quite intimidating when you've got, you know, there's five different metrics that, that they use. But, uh, you know, we found the Naropa one was actually a lot easier reading through it. It was like this is going to take us days and days and days. But it actually took one script editor two days on the first three scripts and you suddenly look at the balance of characters and you're like oh okay it's really really helpful so that it sounds like the message is don't be afraid to try it and and you know test yourselves on it well i i think it's much harsher than that i think we we all have to do it because uh you know i'm not i'm not being funny but our future really depends on the young scientists of the future and if we're not producing them and if we're not getting them there you know with the climate change and you know people needing to come up with great virus vaccinations if we're not pulling our weight then we are really doing a huge disservice to the globe let alone the media industry in the uk and the us definitely thank you um, and thank you for everything that your company is doing to promote best practice standards in, in that regard. Um, I'd like to bring Millie in now. Um, Millie, we've spent a lot of time today talking um, about the importance of what girls and boys see on screen. And at the moment, um, that's you. Um, <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more about the Odd Squad and in particular your character? Yeah, so um, I started Odd Squad when I was seven years old and now I'm 14. So it's like half of my life I was filming (laughs) the show and I've had the most amazing experiences through Odd Squad, like traveling and and meeting amazing people. And um, in terms of what I like most about my character, I would say uh, I love how she's a strong leader. Um, on TV and how other girls can can see her when they're watching the show and and really look up to her as as sort of a role model and I think that she's like a really smart character but she's also funny and she cares a lot about um, the other characters in the show like the people in her squad as well and I think that it's cool uh, for people to see such a great leader um, on TV. My, um, I was mentioning to you earlier, my daughter has got really into the Odd Squad and so she was really excited when I said that we were going to be talking today and she's six and very impressionable so it is great that there are role models like you on screen for her to uh, look up to. Um, Do you um, receive any comments from girls about um, getting more interested in science after watching The Odd Squad? What kind of feedback do you get? Yeah, um, I actually get a lot of messages from parents talking about um, how the show and how Miss Ella has sort of like impacted their their child's life. And I think it's it's really cool for me to see those messages from people, even if it's sort of like a a quick, like you're doing a great job, My, my daughter loves the show. Um, I think that, I mean, it's just so amazing for me to see that. Um, But also, um, I go to an all-girls school uh, 
that has a really big focus on empowering girls in STEM. And so I think that's really cool that more schools now are sort of like um, uh, adding that into their school system as well. Brilliant. Um, I'd love to know just a little bit more about your path into acting. So you said you've been in the odd squad since you were seven. How, how did you get into it and what do you enjoy most about it? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I guess I just went through the audition process and um, the last uh, callback, like chemistry read was the day after my sixth birthday. And um, I think I, I went home early that day actually, because uh, I was super sick. I was throwing up that day, I think because mm -hmm. uh, of the nerves and I totally thought I had lost it. I was like, no, they're, they're never gonna cast me now. I had to go home, but uh, I ended up getting it, so that's great. But um, I mean, my favorite part of, of filming the show has definitely been like all the people that I got to meet, um, whether it's like cast or crew or uh, a highlight was even going to the White House for the egg roll when uh, Obama was president. Um, that was like a highlight in my career for sure. Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you for um, being an inspiration to so many girls and including my daughter and boys out there as well. Um, before I open up the discussion to um, the audience questions, I just wanted to come back to the importance of collaboration. And I was gonna come back to you, Sarah, actually. Um, this project is, is a joint piece of work between the British consulate here in New York and the US-based Gina Davis Institute. Um, and so from, from where you sit, Sarah, I wanted to ask, you know, are there particular areas where you see the UK and the US working together more on this agenda? Yeah, so there's obviously, um, I mean, the, the, the example of uh, sharing really good practice that I would highlight is probably the, um, the BFI, the British Film Institute. The British Film Institute is an arm's length body, a sort of body that belongs to the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. And uh, it uh, does all sorts of work promoting British film and um, ensuring that uh, people are entering creative industries with the right uh, skills and so on. But one of the things that it did back in 2016, uh, working with one of our former ministers was create these diversity standards. And the diversity standards promote inclusion both behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, and um, they are currently working with the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science, uh, home of the Oscars, to uh, model their award eligibility criteria entirely on those standards. So they're working with them on that. And um, they've also been embraced by studios like uh, Paramount. And I think uh, the BFI is currently working with Facebook uh, to license the standards blueprint and trademark. So, you know, really acting as a global leader in this area and working with US uh, companies in order to spread the word. Now, it's definitely, that's an instance of where, um, thanks to uh, it, maybe it being a kind of government funded body and a sort of political impetus, the BFI developed that, there will be fantastic things going on in the States that we don't know about that we can learn from too. So that would be one example of the kind of collaboration, which means that we can all be doing better on the back of the work that we're individually doing if we know more about it and can work together on it. I mean, the other thing I'd say is sort of to, to Billy's point on, um, on what um, our um, public service broadcasters can do, especially in children's television, where they have such an important role, you know, a question about whether there is more that can be done on co-production and on ensuring that some of the resources that go with that can be shared to produce shows that can be seen in all over the world uh, in order to break down some of these stereotypes even further. Thank you, um, really exciting um, uh, activity there. Billy, I don't know if you wanted to come back on that with your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the BFI, um, uh, grading and and what you have to achieve is is really it's it sets a high bar and it's really good but but the key is if you want to get um your tax credits then you have to fulfill that criteria and that's going to concentrate any producer so it will be really interesting to see how that works in the us um where, whether the whether the budgets are tied to fulfilling that criteria i think that's the only way to get significant movement on this um i forgot what was the other part of the question i've forgotten 
Um, it was it was really about okay. how we could collaborate um, more effectively yeah. in UK and US. I mean, I think the U, the the. We're, we're pretty good, the UK and the US, the UK and Canada as well. Um, yeah, I think those, it's just fantastic that we can get more collaboration going there. Um, we're also pretty good, Australia, Canada, um, pretty good network of co-productions. I think it will be interesting to see how it works in other areas like Russia and Poland, where I'm not sure these criteria are going to be seen uh, with open arms. We, we've stumbled across it a couple of times. Um, but yeah, we you know, for countries that are thinking in the same way. Um, yeah, it's, it's more and more cooperation and collaboration got to be. Here, here. Um, just to remind the audience that uh, we're open to Q&A now. So please do put your questions in the chat. And uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Caroline Heldman back as well. If you have any particular questions about the research uh, that the Gina Davis Institute has carried out, then please do also use this as an opportunity to um, ask questions. Um, we've got one question in um, from uh, for Caroline. Um, Caroline, um, it's a question about how figures have changed over the years. So the audience member says they saw Gina Davis at Kids Screen three to four years ago. How have figures changed uh, since uh, she launched her institute? Oh, Caroline, you're um... As you noted, Gina was the first in this space, right? She was the first, uh, her organization was the first to really be systematically analyzing this and talking about um, underrepresentation of girls and women and later other identities and intersectional identities. And I'm happy to report that in 2011, uh, leading uh, female characters in television um, achieved gender equity. And then we saw a few years after that, um, that uh, it, the same thing happened with uh, family films. And so if you look at the trajectory um, starting in 2004, then by 2011, and, and the model of change is that you take data and then you go to content creators in a non-blame, non-shame way, and you lobby within the industry, um, that those efforts, you know, it took six years to get gender equity along that, that, that one measure and uh, in family television and then a few years later in family film. Um, the, the new frontier, of course, is more intersectional representations and also representations beyond just the leading characters. So making sure that supporting characters, minor characters, and in particular, background characters who are the easiest to immediately make uh, you know, representative of the population, um, making sure that content creators are focused on that. Thank you. Uh, good to see a sign language interpreter here. Uh, thank you, Martin, for that. Um, and I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the BSL, I'm afraid, um, but we will try and um, make sure that for all of our events, we have um, sign language. Billy, did you want to come in? Yeah, I've got a question for Caroline. It's um, about why the US uh, STEM lead females was seen to have um, to sacrifice their personal life, uh, whereas the UK ones seem to manage to do both. I was just fascinated to wonder why, that, or if you've got any insights, why the US would do that, why, why that's occurring. That's a great question, Billy. My thought would be that uh, there are some more pernicious traditional gender roles at play. So what you'll often see in, in US content is a STEM character who is high powered. She's you know, really successful in her profession. And there's, there's this underlying storyline that she had to give up you know, having a family, having kids, or she's a terrible parent. Um, yeah. So I'm not entirely sure, although my familiarity with, you know, my limited familiarity with UK culture and US culture would say it's probably to do with some more entrenched uh, gender roles here in the US. Okay. Great. Um, I've got a question for Millie. Um, Millie, what can parents do to make sure their kids are watching the right thing? I have a six-year-old daughter 
and I'm very glad that she's into the odd squad but how can I support her in making sure that she watches good diverse uh, TV programs with good role models? Yeah I mean I think that um, things are really opening up now so um, as in uh, children's television as well so I feel like anything really on uh, TVO and PBS like those are great uh, shows as well as educational as well um, with diversity so I think also like maybe researching some some shows as well. Uh, I think that would be great for parents to do. Fab, and, and thank you, Dr. Caroline Helbin, for your um, uh, suggestions for parents as well. Um, I think that's really important. Um, it's not just content creators that are responsible for what children watch, it's also parents um, as well. Um, another question from the audience. Um, we've talked a lot about public broadcasters but how supportive have you found the streamers in addressing diversity? I think that's probably for Billy, um, maybe, and, and Dr. Caroline Heldman, you, you might want to come in afterwards as well. Uh, incredibly so. Um, <clears throat> the thing with the streamers though, it, it's, so my, my home culture is the UK. So um, that's where my focus is and Daryl McQueen's focus um, is on trying to shift um, perceptions but um, yeah I think I think because they're going globally and um, I don't know there's a, there's a mindset which is very forward-looking um, there are not many nostalgia shows uh, on Netflix Amazon Apple uh, Disney plus now is the streamer so um, I think they've got a, a big eye to the for, to to the future. I mean, especially when you're looking at people like Amazon, Netflix, Apple, all those guys are tech companies first. So they're really they've really got an eye on the future, um, and and <laughs> that we need good STEM people. Um, whereas you know the BBC, they've got a you know huge history and a massive massive audience. Well, it's naught and to 100 isn't it for the bbc whereas i think the the vod companies can segment you know netflix won't do any sports it won't do it doesn't do news um whereas the bbc itv channel 4 they've got to do the lot um so very very tricky but um in our experience and and the other companies i know in the uk who've been working with the vod have found it it's very quick and very refreshing um Let's hope it stays that way. I'm sure it will. Very encouraging. They, they aren't the base. They aren't the cultural mm -hmm. base. Mm. I would just say in the US, uh, streaming content is has more diversity uh, in terms of creatives. And that is definitely translated into more diversity along whatever measure you, whatever identity or dimension you're looking at. Um, so streaming content is, uh, is has more, um, Traditionally, marginalized groups represented, and when they are represented, it's in more diverse ways. Although at this point in time, we are finding the content creators um, are very open to considering this in a way that they weren't a decade ago. Mm. That's I think very encouraging. I think it's also key to point out that the VOD services I'm talking about are curated. It's a curated service, unlike YouTube. So YouTube has curated channels on it, but also it has a stream of stuff that is not particularly well complied. And I think, uh, and as we know, you know, almost 50% of kids in the UK and more in the US go to get content from the some of the less filtered streams. Mm -hmm. I think that's got to be a huge area um, because you don't see such positive STEM, for instance, or diversity on some of the kids' entertainment channels, which are pretending to be educational channels. Um, they're making millions and millions and millions a week, but they do not comply to any of the basic broadcasting regulations that we would expect from linear, from how the BBC has grown up, and also the, how the VOD companies also um, comply and curate. I think that's my bit, you know, that's it's slightly the, the slight air of YouTube that's the Wild West, which is slightly terrifying. 
I'm really, uh, Hannah, if you don't mind, I'm just really interested in the question there that's about video games mm -hmm. and how much uh, video games also play a role here. And if I think about um, Roblox and also Minecraft and the extent to which they're popular with girls and they're very, uh, they are quite creative and sort of engineering-ish, uh, I suppose there's a sort of question about how much they're designed to be uh, attractive to girls and to sort of lead them on uh, to develop new skills. And um, I don't know if the Institute has done any work on it. I'm afraid I don't know of any that we've done in uh, the UK, but also be fascinating to know whether there's any of your the amazing technology that Billy and, and Caroline were both talking about that enable us to judge whether something is, uh, how genders are sort of portrayed within that that could be applied to the video game sector. So that's just a, I mean, we may not know the answer. I know we're running out of time, but I just thought that was a really interesting question when you think about how much time kids spend on that kind of media too. I'll just make a quick pitch that we have the first uh, video game, wide scale video game study coming out uh, in the next couple of months that looks at uh, representations of gender and other identities. And it is, uh, you're right, Sarah, that the, the amount of time um, that young people are spending, especially boys and even men are spending in that medium exceeds other mediums. So it's a really important frontier to do research on. Great. Thank you. Um, well, that brings us to the end of our time today, I'm afraid. Uh, I want to say a huge thank you to our three panelists for their excellent and thought provoking comments. Um, thank you to our ambassador, Dame Karen Pierce, for her opening remarks and for all her continued support of the work uh, here at the British Consulate on equality uh, and inclusion in this space. Um, and thank you, uh, special thanks to Gina Davis and Dr. Caroline Heldman for all of their outstanding work and for all the Institute's work uh, in, in ensuring that we understand how we can do better in this space. As I mentioned, I have a six-year-old daughter and I have to say I've been really challenged uh, through the collaboration to be more discerning uh, about what she and her younger brother watch on TV. Uh, and I suspect I'm not the only one here today who's been challenged in, in that way. So thank you for that challenge. And thank you very much to our audience for joining us here today as well. I hope everybody has a good rest of their day. Thanks very much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>